Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bonner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick. With a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we discuss what Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and others consider the single greatest threat to humanity. Why death is not a binary event that makes you transition from being alive or dead at a specific moment in time. We ask if you could spend $1,000 on a chance to live forever, would you take it? We look at the biology behind cryogenics, vitrification, and putting your body on biological pause. And we explore why poverty, climate change, war, and all other problems melt away in the face of this one massive issue with our guest, Tim Urban. The Science of Success continues to grow with more than 725,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, hitting number one new noteworthy, and more. A ton of our listeners are curious about how to organize and remember everything, how to keep track of all this amazing information. I get tons of listener emails asking me, Matt, how do you organize yourself? How do you keep track of all the incredible knowledge you get from reading hundreds of books, interviewing amazing experts, listening to podcasts, and more? Because of that, we've created an amazing free resource for you, and you can get it for free by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. It's a free guide called How to Organize and Remember Everything. Again, to get it, all you have to do is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, or go to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and put in your email. In our previous episode, we discussed whether time speeds up as we get older, why your life story only makes sense looking in reverse, whether or not brain games actually work, the importance of proactive learning instead of passive learning, why psychology confirms all your worst fears about studying and getting smarter, and much more with a special two-guest interview featuring Dr. Art Markman and Dr. Bob Duke. If you want to master your mind, listen to that episode. Today, we have another incredible guest on the show, Tim Urban. Tim is the creator of one of my favorite blogs, Wait But Why. He's become one of the most popular writers on the internet with fans including Maria Popova, Sam Harris, and Elon Musk. Tim combines long-form content, humor, and stick figures to explain the world's most interesting concepts including SpaceX, AI, procrastination, and we're going to dig into a number of these. His content has become so popular that according to Fast Company, he's captured a level of reader engagement that even new media giants would be envious of. With an average of over 1.5 million unique readers visiting and engaging on Wait But Why every month. Tim, welcome to the Science of Success. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited to have you on here. So for listeners who may not be familiar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. Yeah. I started blogging. Well, actually, I started blogging a long time ago. I started... um. 2005 with a, a blog that I was kind of doing on the side. And I, I always kept it as something I did on the side, but I really liked it. And it was in about mid-2013 that I decided to start a new blog and go full-time and kind of see what would happen. And, you know, it, I always kind of wished on the other blog I could see what would happen if I could just, you know, work on a post all week. And so this was a chance to do that. And I started that in 2013 and to partner. And in the last three and a half years, that's kind of Basically, what I've been doing is full-time blogging about all different kinds of things. So what is Wait But Why and, and why did you decide to start it? Yeah, well, Wait But Why, what it has become is a long-form stick figure illustrated blog about everything from kind of the human condition and kind of human psychology to the questions of the universe and the future, and the big things going on in tech, and kind of whatever I'm interested in. I feel like what I just said is like a bunch, is, is like a list of things that a lot of people are kind of interested in all those things, and so am I. And so I just kind of write about all those things. And the posts go really in depth. I'll spend sometimes over a month working on a post. Sometimes they get really long. And I really kind of enjoyed the liberty that I have as an independent blogger to just go in as much depth as I want without having to you know, worry about limitations on either time or words. So that's what it is. Why I, when I started it, I, I didn't say 
I want to do a long floor, you know, a long form blog. But I didn't really know exactly what it was going to be. I did know I wanted to write about a lot of different kinds of things. And I did know that, you know, that, that, that I wanted to do in high quality things because so many, so much of what I saw on the internet was clearly done for clicks, done for volume. So it was by a site that was trying to put out a lot of stuff. And, and I saw that, you know, where the priorities were and I, they weren't on, you know, we want this to be the best piece that we can do. That wasn't really the focus on anything I was, on most things I was reading online. And so I, I said that that, that was the way, that was the thing that I wanted to do different is I wanted to focus on not on volume and, and not even on consistency, but just on trying to do something, you know, quality out of the product. So that was kind of the core initial, the core initial kind of principle. And then, and, and I wanted to have fun. I, I didn't want to, you know, try to figure out what I could write about that would, that would get an audience. Even if I did, I wanted to make sure that, that if I was going to do this for a long time, I ended up doing something I really liked. So I wanted to kind of, it was kind of an outlet for my curiosity and I wanted it to stay that way. And I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, enjoy myself as I was doing it. So, so that was the core idea. And then it's kind of become what it has become. But uh, that, that kind of happened as I as I went. So before we dig into a couple of the, uh, my favorite topics that you've covered on the blog, I'd love to share with our listeners a little bit about your TED Talk and kind of the themes of procrastination. You know, we, we talk a lot about psychology and kind of personal improvement on the show. And so I'd be really curious for you to kind of share the, the story of the TED Talk and the message and, and talk a little bit about procrastination. Yeah. Well, I, I always say I'm not really an expert on anything I write about. Because if I wanted to be an expert on something, I would have to make that the one thing I wrote about, basically. I'd have to spend a bunch of years reading about it. And, and that's not, you know, that's for some people, but not really me. I get ADD'd about topics and want to move on after I've been in one for a while. And I'm curious about so many things that I want to skip around and I want to do a bunch of different things, which means I have time to become what I call like a mini expert on things as I go. Procrastination is an exception that I am an expert on being a procrastinator. I, that's one thing I know. I feel like I understand. I'm not an expert on the deep psychology of it necessarily, or like the you know that's kind of a, the the work of a psychologist. But I am the, an expert on what it feels like to go through this problem and to live with it and to struggle with it and to try a bunch of things that don't work to fix it. And I and I think that made me uh, very qualified to really write about what goes on in the head of a procrastinator, what it feels like and why it's so hard. And so that was that started as a blog post and ended up also being the subject of a TED talk that I did. And the way I the, what I did for that is I kind of just sat back when I first wrote the post and just thought about what actually goes on in the literal like in the second that the the, the exact second when I'm trying to do something and then I I, try, I know I should be doing one thing and then I I go and actually do something else. What is going on in that moment? And I kind of kind of came to the conclusion that there's two characters in my brain and that there's literally two motivations going on. And one of them, which I call the rational decision maker, is this adult, the adult in my brain. And he just says, well, you know, we should be doing, we should do this now so that later we can do this. And the rational decision maker wants to have fun like anyone else, but he just gets that there's, there needs to be a balance. He gets, he can think long term, he can see the big picture and gets that, like, if we do this now, then we can do this later. If we don't do this now, then later is going to be bad and we won't be, you know, think very simple concept. And then there's this other character, the child in my brain. And the child doesn't think long term, lives entirely in the present moment. And I call that child the instant gratification monkey because it really is like a remnant of our animal past. I mean, we are, we have an animal present. We are currently animals. And this is the very kind of primitive part of our brain that simply wants to, you know, eat, reproduce and conserve energy. So, you know, you, we need both of these characters because we are like a weird species. We are an animal that needs to like keep the animal alive and keep the animal like, satisfied. But we're also this weirdly rational animal that has this like super higher being of consciousness that has all these big long-term plans. We live in this very complex, advanced civilization that requires this rational center of our brains and they're living together. It's like, it's like, it's like two very, it's like two very shitty roommates. Like it's like Ernie and Bert are like bad roommates. It's like that. And, and, or, or it's like a really dysfunctional single parent household with an only child and, a, and one parent and they don't. And so I realized that like in that moment, 
the adult will say something, and the, the only everyone's got both characters. The difference between the thing that makes someone a procrastinator is that when they disagree, which is a lot, a non-procrastinator, the adult is is able to say, "Not now, monkey. Sorry, I know you don't want to do this, but we have to." And the monkey relents or gets overpowered, or, or just knows its place, and at this point doesn't even try that hard. And the, in a procrastinator's brain, it goes the other way. The power is not in the right place. The, the adult says this. The, the kid says, "I don't want to do that," and grabs the wheel. And starts driving. And the, and the adult just kind of like helplessly stands there. And so it's a power balance between these two characters. So that's the core of the post. And it's the core of something I've struggled with for a long time. And you seem like a crazy person. But it's actually just that you have this kind of like unhealthy relationship with the two characters. Where like the parent isn't able to control the kid. Is always mad at the kid. The kid probably doesn't like the parent very much. And, um, and, and I don't know whether... <laughs> The, see, the, where I'm not an expert is like the core psychology, like a psychologist might say, oh, well, that's when you, you were, you know, growth was stunted at some age in this one area. And it was stunted because your parents did X, Y, and Z. I don't know that. I don't know why my power balance is off, but I know what is happening. And it's that my power balance there is off. And then so the other part of the post and the talk is that I say, so, you know, it, it, then why, how does any procrastinator get anything done? If the, if, if the power balance is off and anytime something hard needs to happen, the monkey grabs the wheel, why is not always just the problem? And the answer is that there's one other character in the brain, which I call the panic monster, which is a character that's dormant most of the time and you don't notice it. But then when something, when the deadline gets close or when you're in danger of like, you know, public embarrassment or something like that, suddenly he wakes up and starts screaming. And that's the one thing the monkey's scared of. The monkey's not scared of the rational decision maker. But this child in your brain is terrified of the panic monster and will run away. And then the rational decision maker in those moments kind of can kind of grab the wheel and finally, with no monkey there, can go and do your work and do whatever you need to do. And so, you know, a really bad procrastinator situation, you know, the only time they get something done is, is panic. And the reason that's dangerous is not just because panic isn't fun or healthy. It's not going to produce your best work. But something much darker than that and deeper than that, which is that dependent monster only shows up in situations when there's a deadline. And that's fine when you're in school, maybe, or if you have a certain job that's very deadline heavy. But most situations in the real world after school ends, unfortunately, don't have deadlines. So things like, you know, careers in the arts or entrepreneurial careers or something, maybe, you know, you, and anything you want to, or being at work in a job with a boss, but somewhere where you want to, spend some of your time on self-improvement, long-term self-improvement, you know, and actually, you know, you know, learning more, getting better. There's no deadlines on those things. And the panic monster doesn't wake up to those things. And then of course, like all this stuff that makes people happy outside of work, you know, learning and learning a new instrument or going into the gym, getting healthy or, you know, working on your relationship or, you know, just, yeah, taking care of your health or cooking really good meals, getting better at something, all these things that kind of make life rich. There's no deadlines on those. And without the panic monster, if, if they're hard, the monkey's usually going to not let you do them and you don't have anyone to help you. So, you know, procrastinators, they often, you know, people see them as people who, oh, they cram at the last minute and they, they have a bad relationship with deadlines. But actually, the much sadder thing and the thing that affects way more people, I think, very quietly and behind the scenes is this kind of concept of long-term procrastination, this situation where there's no panic monster to help. And the procrastinator just just kind of has this problem forever, kind of, and it just sits there and kind of eats away at them, and no one else even really knows about it. Often, it's kind of like their own personal like struggle, and they re have huge regrets later, and they end up doing a lot of what what you can think of as kind of the really urgent but not important stuff. And there's a lot of that in life, you know, emails and your errands and pick your kids up, or you have to go out to dinner with your friend that you made a plan, you know, so you do that stuff because those things have little deadlines, the urgent stuff. But so often the urgent stuff isn't what's important. And the important stuff isn't, isn't urgent most of the time, especially, you know, big life things. Like I want to change my job. You know, that kind of thing is not, not ever going to be like, I have to do that by Tuesday is that that doesn't exist. You could skip it Tuesday and do it Wednesday or Thursday or never. They, so they spend a lot of time doing that stuff and they spend almost no time doing the important stuff. That's not urgent, which like I said, is mostly, is usually the really big things in life, the things that will end up on your gravestone, the things that, you know, you'll be on your deathbed really proud of. 
that kind of stuff is really often, you know, not urgent. And without a panic monster, the procrastinator uh, can can really kind of miss out on that stuff in life. And so th- that's what like procrastinators need to think about is like not just am I bad with deadlines, but is there important but not urgent stuff in my life that if I really look at this honestly, I'm just not doing because I'm not good at doing stuff when there's not a, a like a, a external pressure. And I think a lot of people can answer that question and say, yes, there is. And it's, it's bothering me. So as a self-proclaimed procrastinator, how do you overcome that challenge? A lot of times I don't. A lot of times I continue to have this be my core struggle like yesterday when I have been working on this one blog post for a long time now and I'm dying to just get, get it going. Like a lot of readers are emailing me and wondering what the hell is going on. And I'm very frustrated with my pace on this. So you think, okay, I sat down all day yesterday to work. I would just be writing work because I've done so much research already. Already outlined it. And what I did is this is like a monkey clever tactic. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, the rational decision maker isn't so weak that he's gonna let the monkey like sit around and watch TV all day. I don't do that kind of procrastination usually. But what I did do is I as I read articles that were relevant, research. I researched all day even though I've already done plenty of research for a blog post. I'm not writing a book on this. I don't need to do more research. And I did anyway because my perfectionism kicked in, which is some, you know, the monkey kind of like take, can kind of use char- other characters in your brain and like, you know, for his assistance or uses my perfectionist guy all the time. And so, yeah, perfectionism kicked in. I said, oh, well, now I need to read this. Oh, now there's a hyperlink in that article. Well, I have to read that. And the rational decision maker screaming, saying, stop it. This doesn't matter. This is, or this is, this, this is not important to the long-term goals here. Reading, reading the 65th and 66th articles here. So that's classic. So I, no, I still definitely have, I still definitely struggle. That said, I have written a lot on Wait But Why. I've written probably, you know, almost a hundred pretty long blog posts in three years. You know, that's a lot. That's the equivalent of many books of writing. So I, I managed to conquer something, but I think it's mostly the fact that at the beginning, as I said, I said Wait But Why started by me and a partner. The partner is my friend and business partner who runs kind of this other business that the two of us started in 2007. And he is running that for both of us while I'm writing Wait But Why and starting this kind of what could be a media platform, what could be a, a brand or it could just be a cool project, but I'm starting it for, for both of us. I had kind of a couple things. I had pressure from the fact that I was letting someone else down, not just myself, if I didn't get, if I didn't like work on this early on. So that helped. That was external pressure. And then there were readers pretty quickly. I got lucky in that situation where the readers happened pretty quickly, quicker than I thought they would. But there was an audience, you know, that built up pretty early on in the life of Wait But Why, which for me was huge because suddenly that is kind of a panic monster. It's not a full one like a hard deadline. Like the panic monster's volume of his scream never gets to the, to like a full peak volume, but he's always kind of there because you're of readers and they're going to go away. Uh, that hard earned readership is going to give up on you. They have plenty of other options on the internet. They'll just give up on you and forget about you if you don't write. So I kind of had a some some external pressure, some panic monsters going on. And that's part of why I did that. So I would say that that's I, what I did is kind of an interim step a procrastinator can take. If, they, if it was really important to me to do something like Wait But Why, and I'm really happy and gratified that I have done it. And I think it's like, it's a great thing for me to have done this. But it, I don't think that I did it by solving my procrastination problem. I think I did it by creating panic monsters in my life which is kind of a band-aid. It's kind of, it's a band-aid. It's getting you through the next step without solving the problem. And as far as the problem, I'm still working on it really hard. And I, I hope to one day come back and write another post about, that's called How I Beat Procrastination. That's going to be a fun post to write, and I'm not anywhere near ready to write that yet. So in many ways, it sounds like accountability and kind of creating some external pressure is, is one of the effective strategies that you've used in the past. Yes, it, it is an effective strategy, but it's not a sustainable long-term strategy. I don't. Think. I mean, it's, it, it could be. It's just not great. Like, it's not. I, I think the, the the really good long-term strategy will be learning how to just have the adult have the power when there's something hard to do that I don't want to do. That that the adult has to say, "Well, it's time to do it anyway." And we're just going to do it, even though there's no deadline, even though it's kind of amorphous, we don't even know how to really do this, we're just going to get working on it. 
and be efficient about that. And there's some look, there's some days I succeeded. That's not like I, I'm, you know, can't ever do it, but but not as much as I would like. And so for me, you know, I've done this, I've done kind of, a, as I said, like a band aid solution, which is build external pressure. When, because some people have it because they have a boss and they have a schedule they're on and they have to. If you don't, that's really dangerous for a procrastinator. And you have to, if you, if you haven't solved your long term problem, you have to figure out how to build external pressure into your life so that you're forced to make progress because otherwise it's going to make you really unhappy. I'd love to change directions a little bit and get into some of the topics that you've covered on the blog. One of my absolute favorite posts or kind of, I guess, series of posts that you did was was a two-part series about artificial intelligence. And that I highly recommend anybody listening to to go and read that because there's no way we could cover everything in there just in this interview. But I'd love for you to kind of share at a very high level, some of the core findings that you that you had when you wrote those articles and kind of the core themes of them. Yeah, that's definitely one of the craziest topics I've dove into since I have started writing. It's uh, it's it's kind of when you, when you get into that topic, every other topic kind of melts away in importance in your head because you know this is like imagine that there's a bunch of like monkeys on the earth only and there's no humans or anything. And they're trying to do a bunch of things. They're trying to like figure out better ways to like crack their coconuts and like better ways to build n- nests and trees. And and they're they're fighting with other monkey tribes and they're dealing with all those things. And they seem like all these dire issues. And then some monkeys are going about and they're saying, "Oh, we're doing something new over here. We're building this thing called humans." It's also an interesting project. We know from looking at that that that's not a normal project. That's not one of the projects. That is a project that's going to define every part of their existence. It's going to define all the other projects. If they they can build humans that want to help them, the humans will easily, easily solve all their problems. They could have a grocery store just for monkeys with every possible food they need. It's not about cracking into coconut. Now they can have any kind of food they'd ever want if the humans want are working for them. If the humans aren't working for them, uh, humans could kill them all very easily without any. they They could cage them. They could poison their food. They could tranquilize, gun them. They could shoot them. They could tase them. So they could, they they could, they could have bombs. I mean, there's not, there's not absolutely no match if the humans aren't on their side. Or it could be somewhere in the middle where the humans kind of ignore them, do their own thing. Sometimes the monkeys are in the way and then the humans hurt them in order to fix that. Or sometimes the monkeys, um, the humans find compassion for the monkeys and want to help. Some of them want to help and they can be a great help. But either way, building humans is, would be the most significant thing that the entire species of ape had ever done by far. That's what we're doing. We're building our version of humans. Uh, We're building something far smarter than we are. And the thing that confuses people is they say, well, you know, my computer's already smarter than me. It can hold more information. It has better memory. It's faster. It can, you know, my calculator can multiply 10-digit numbers way faster. So computers are already smarter. And the answer is no, they're not. What they are is they're... They're more intelligent in a very narrow sense, in very specific sense. Whatever that the computer's specific job is, it's better than humans at that job. But humans have this amazing capacity for breadth. We can we have this incredible diverse intelligence that can we, we, we have wisdom, we have social skills, we have creativity, we can learn from experience, we have reasoning. We have general, you know, all this general reasons. We, we have, uh, uh, we're smart in a way that no computer is or ever has been not even close. There's never been a smart computer, if you want to define it like that. Uh, in the AI community, they define that as general intelligence. There's never been a computer that had anything close to what we have, general intelligence. What it, computers have is narrow intelligence. So we have a lot of artificial narrow intelligence on the planet that's really great at one thing. So what humans are working on right now, and the thing the post was about was not, you know, Siri and Pandora and all of this artificial narrow intelligence. It was about the concept of building AGI, artificial general intelligence, and what that'll be like. And it's not an easy thing to get there. So I, I went through a bunch of different ways we're trying to do it and, and the challenges on the hardware side and on the software side. Our, our own brain is a, is a mystery to us. It's extremely complex. Some people think it's the most complex object in the known universe. And trying to replicate what it can do is not easy. So we're trying to do that. But the thing is, first of all, that alone would change everything. If there was a computer that actually could just talk to you like a person and you could, the computer could look at any situation and just kind of give you advice or think about it with you. 
and have its own ideas and plans about any part of your life. I mean, that, that's completely unheard of. But the thing about it that's really intense is that it's not going to just once we get there. A lot of the way that we're trying to build this is by building computers that can improve themselves, but they can make itself smarter through, you know, it, it'll be good at researching AI and coding and changing its own architecture, its own coding to make itself smarter. That's how a lot of people think we're going to get to this. And what's going to happen when it gets there, it's going to keep making itself smarter. And it's going to be able to do that more and more as it gets smarter. So, so you're going to have something that's the, that's the intelligence of a normal human, and it'll be as good a computer scientist as kind of a normal human. But other than the fact that it can work 24 hours a day and never forgets anything and can sync up with other computers for, to, to have all the same information. But, you know, it, it'll be pretty good. Suddenly it gets itself to be Einstein's level of intelligence, which we think is a huge difference from the average human. But actually, in the big scheme of things, there's a very small difference on the intelligence scale between the smartest and the dumbest human. Very small. And so now we have a computer that's as smart as Einstein. Now, it's a really good computer scientist. And before you know it, it makes itself smarter than any human's ever been. And now it starts just leaping up in intelligence. And it can be like, once, it, once we get there, whether that's in 20 years or 40 years or 60 years, you know, people think it's around you know, those, that's kind of the ballpark area where they think we can get to general intelligence. It might be a month from that point, or maybe a week, or maybe an hour, when suddenly the computer that has hit General intelligence has hit something else, called what we call artificial super intelligence. Something that, you know, if Einstein had an IQ of 200, whatever, just say, and, you know, an average person's IQ is maybe 110 or something, we're talking about the computer's IQ is now at like 50,000. Unheard of. Things we don't, you don't even understand. Just like a monkey can't get what a human even can do. A monkey doesn't even know that we do what we do. It can't even get that, even if we try to explain all the things humans do. So not only can it not do those things, it won't even, it can't really understand even that we're doing it. It's not even, doesn't even have that level of, of capacity. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now we have this thing on the planet that can do things that seem like magic to us that are so amazing. Not only can we not do it, but we literally can't even understand what it's doing. Even if it, if it sat down and spoke in perfect English to us, and it tried to explain, it, it, it can't, our brains are not capable of even understanding what it's working on. That's such an intense concept that, again, it, it, everything else melts away. You know, we talk about climate change, poverty, war. These things are huge problems. Nothing compared to the problem we're going to have if superintelligence is not either on, on our side in the exact way we need it to be. And those problems are no problem at all if the AI wants to help us fix them, because it's going to be like a monkey smashing its hand into a padlock a thousand times when a human can just walk over and undo it. There'll be no problem for the monkey, for the AI to fix all of our problems if it wants to, or we could very well, very well go extinct in the next hundred years because AI does something we don't want to. And the thing, the, the, the mistake people make is they anthropomorphize, meaning they apply human values and characteristics to something that's not human and never will be. So they think, oh, it's going to be evil. You know, I don't know if you're watching Westworld, but they're like, oh, they're, they're, the, the AI is going to want, it's going to, you know, it's going to feel bad about itself. It's going to want to be the, inter no, that, that's what a human does. What, what it's, it's much more like is a human might build a house because it wants to build a house and it builds on top of an anthill and it kills all the ants in the anthill by doing it. That human doesn't hate the ants. The human's not like, yes, now I'm the king of all the ants. No, the human's just doing its thing, and the ant happened to be in the way. And when you know, and so the, the scary thing is that with, when the AI is that smart, it has an unbelievable amount of power. And that power, even with just an elbow, it could elbow the human race off the table by accident with that power. Like if, if it just if we're in the way of something it wants to do, and we haven't very specifically programmed it to value human life then we, we really could. I mean, we, we, it's, it's, it's an unprecedented amount of power on this planet. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen with that. That's just a huge question mark. So yeah, that's that topic. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, it's really interesting because if you look at like people like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, all of these re people who are on the forefront of technology, you kind of hear them off in the distance being like, hey, guys, this AI thing is really big. No one's really paying attention to it. And I'd heard that a number of times and kind of thought, you know, okay, well, wh whatever, what are these guys really talking about? And your, your series of articles really brought to light for me the kind of massive stakes and, and the consequences and, and the, 
you know, there's a couple pieces of it that I'd really love to dig into. Like, you know, one of the things that, that you touched on is the idea that all these other challenges that we're facing, all these things that seem like major, major risks or challenges, global warming or climate change, poverty, you know, economic displacement, war, there's sort of this binary outcome when artificial intelligence happens, right? And, and you know, we can talk about the science and, and you've done a ton of research and talk about the science behind this is very, very valid that it's not really a question of if we're going to have artificial super intelligence, it's, it's inevitable at some point. And when that inevitably gets created, there's kind of a binary outcome. It's either the AI solves all of our problems forever, or we get completely wiped off the planet and humanity goes extinct. Yeah, kind of is. And so it's one notch more complicated than that. I mean, even the good side gets tricky in that when we say solves all of our problems, okay, well, who is determining what our problems are? ISIS thinks it knows what problems are and what right and wrong is. ISIS thinks solving all of our problems means killing all infidels and creating a caliphate that rules the earth. So that's its idea. Even within the U.S., with fairly like-minded people, you have people on, on opposite sides of the aisle, different ideologies, who all say, well, I think, so but in a very broad sense, you know, yes, the, the big problems you're talking about, it can solve, but it has to be created by people who have similar values to you that, in, that, that successfully program the AI to have those values, to understand those values, or it's going to going to be a problem because, you know, you can imagine how many different humans on different parts of the planet with different motivations and different values are going to want to make sure the AI does what it thinks, what, what they think are the right things. So it's very tricky. It's not like, you know, even, you know, it's not an easy scenario to picture where everything goes right for everybody. So there is that. But yes, it, it is pretty binary whether in general, this is a force for great good, at least to someone. Or this is a a, a, a a destructive force like nothing we've ever seen, like like a destructive force like the asteroid was to the dinosaurs. It has that kind of potential. What's funny is it just it, these two topics we've talked about so far, procrastination AI, they have a lot in common in that when Elon and Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and a lot of these people who won't try to warn us about AI, Nick Bostrom, what they say sounds a lot like the rational decision maker of humanity saying, hey, let's do this slowly and carefully or not at all, maybe, since if we're thinking really long term, we're playing with fire here. You know, they think we're kind of a bunch of kids playing with a bomb. And, and what humanity is kind of doing is kind of the same thing humanity does when it comes to getting ourselves in climate change trouble, which is we're, it's humanity being controlled by its instant gratification monkey. Climate change is a full instant gratification monkey thing. It's species thinking two feet, only being able to see two feet in front of its face, trying to do stuff that's going to make it money in the next 10 years at any given point, and not worrying about the big picture. And AI, you kind of say the same thing. It's these entrepreneurs and, and these, these developers who are just working kind of you know, you know feverishly on this thing for, 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 so to change the world. They, they probably have good motivation, most of them. but it, it, it's it's a slight, still kind of slightly instant gratification motivation where it's there, there's some major potential long term consequences and it's just not the thing that they seem to be focusing on. They're saying build, 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 let's do it. So I, I kind of feel like um, the same thing that makes humans problematic this battle in our brain between the long term thinking adult and the instant gratification visit wanting child, which you know for my case comes up in procrastination. For other people, it comes up in eating eating unhealthy or in not being faithful in a relationship or many other ways that, that this battle in our brain manifests itself. Uh, I think it's also a, it, it, humanity as a whole is kind of dealing with the same battle. And I think that AI might be the most important example of where that battle is going on. And in this case, for better or worse, hopefully not for worse, the side that is trying to build and is not thinking too much about the long-term stuff, there, there's a lot more of them out there right now. And so, you know, I kind of have my fingers crossed here thinking like, I hope somehow this goes well, because it seems to be happening. And it, the people making it, I'm not sure they're thinking about human extinction. They're thinking about their particular app and how developing a little bit better AI for that app can make them a lot richer and make their app a lot better and can make a bigger impact in the world. And then someone else in a different part of the world is working on, on their software and they're coming up with breakthroughs in AI for their software. 
And together as a species, we are moving collectively down this road that's going to end up with artificial super intelligence. But, you know, we're all kind of doing it in like an instant gratification way. So I do think that this bit, this kind of child adult battle is kind of the story of, of us and the story of our time and the story of the future and for, you know, for better or worse. And AI is such an important topic. I highly recommend anybody listening that, that really wants to dig in on this. You know, as we said, some of the smartest thinkers on the planet right now consider this to be one of the most important topics. Read both of the Wait But Why posts about artificial intelligence, and we will make sure to include those in the show notes so that you can that you can take a look. But I highly recommend everybody that I talk to that this topic comes up even remotely. I send them the articles and say you need to read this immediately. I'd love to I'd love to pivot a little bit and talk about another topic that's kind of controversial which is cryonics. You've written about that or you know many people refer to it as cryogenics which I think you talk about as kind of a misnomer. But I'd love for you to share sort of your thoughts and experiences around that. Yeah. So cryonics, yeah, cryogenics is the study of is is the branch of physics that deals with really cold temperatures. The branch of science. So it's like, you know, anything that has to do with cold temperatures of metal or rock or like, you know, uh, embryos, you know, for, you know, what we call frozen embryos or artificial organs. A big topic. Cryonics is a specific thing that deals with what people who don't know what it is say, you know, call, you know, freezing a human after they die to try to bring them back to life later, which sounds rightly insane. And when I first, you know, when I would hear about that, I'd say, okay, that's obviously like kind of nuts people, you know, people who like can't accept death and are just like desperate and are trying some crazy thing that obviously won't work. Then I learned a lot more about it. And I understood how wrong my conception of it was. I learned a lot. I spent, you know, two weeks just doing nothing other than reading about cryonics, you know, and I learned that a bunch of conceptions are wrong. So first of all, you know, people say it's freezing dead people. So the first thing is the word freezing is wrong. If you freeze a human, the liquid in their bodies, which is most of what our body is, uh, turns to ice, which crystallize, which means it actually like, you know, A, it expands to 9% bigger than its normal volume, and B, it crystallizes, and the crystals themselves slash through cell membranes and completely irreparably damage cells. You cannot freeze a human without killing a human permanently. What cryonics does is it vitrifies a human. What vitrifies means is the same thing we do with, again, with embryos and organs, artificial organs, or sorry, not artificial, uh, transplant organs. And it's, it's actually, so the concept of, you know, glass is not a solid in the normal sense. Glass does not form an organized crystalline structure when it's in its solid state. Glass, it looks like a liquid and that it's just a jumble of atoms and molecules. It, like a liquid, they just aren't moving. It's the only difference. They're not moving. They're too viscous. They can't move. So that's what they do to a human. They, well, well let, let me come back to that actually because I want to talk about the dead part first. So freezing dead people. Let's talk about the word dead and we'll come back to freezing. So here's the big part about cryonics is that the, the reason we get confused about why someone could ever try to bring back a dead person is that we think of the word dead as a binary thing. Someone is living and then you could pinpoint the exact second that they die. And once they're dead, they're dead as anyone who's ever been dead. And you're either alive or dead at any given point. That's not true. Cryonicists see death not as a moment, but as a process. And if you really look at the science, they're the smart ones about this. They're correct in that. 50 years ago, if someone is walking down the street and they collapse and their heart's not beating and they're, they're not breathing, they'd be con declared dead. That's it. Nothing to do. Their heart's not beating. They're not breathing. It's over. And they'd be taken to the funeral home and that's the end of them. Today, with more technology, if that same thing happens, they wouldn't be declared dead. They'd be rushed to the hospital. They'd be, someone would give them CPR. Then they'd rush into the hospital and use a defibrillator and many other more advanced techniques to try to bring them back or not even bring them back, but just to keep them alive because they're not dead. And we know, and so it, when that happens and that person ends up walking out of the hospital later that day, we don't say, Oh, you were dead and you came back. We said, thank God you didn't die. That person, it's so what, what that shows is that the person 50 years ago who fell over on the street, they weren't dead. They were hopeless. They were unable to be saved with the technology of the time. That's a big difference. So what cryonicists say is when a lot, today when someone dies, when they die of cancer, when they die of a stroke, many things that we die of, they say 
that person's not dead. That person is unable to be just saved with 2016 technology. And with our, the, our, the hospitals today can't save them. Now, if there was a hospital across the city, if, if someone's in a hospital dying and there's a hospital across the city that has a tool that can save them, but the one at this hospital doesn't, everyone agrees we would get an ambulance and rush them to that hospital to try to save them. What a cryonicist is trying to do is rush someone to a hospital in the future that can save them because the hospitals in the future probably will be able to. I strongly bet that in 100 years or 50 years, someone most of the things that someone dies in a hospital today of would not be a death sentence anymore. And so what they're trying to do is rush them to a hospital in the future, and they do that by putting them on biological pause. The reason a frozen embryo can be frozen for a long time is that it's not actually frozen. It's that it doesn't, if it, it doesn't die in that state because biology officially, it's proven many times, can sustain the concept of being vitrified where they co cool the embryo or the organ to such a cold state that, that without changing its structure, without freezing the liquid, the, the atoms can no longer move anywhere. Now, how do they do that? Well, how do you vitrify a human? you pump antifreeze into the bloodstream so that now you can bring the temperature down, 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 well below freezing, and, and you still won't get freezing uh, of the liquid. It'll just slow and slow and slow till all activity stops. There's not any atom in the human body that can move. It's just paused exactly the way it was. With an organ, we know how to do that, and then we know how to unvitrify it, bring it back, and have the organ work in, an, in a real living thing. Uh, and with an embryo, there are people walking around the earth today that at some point were frozen, at, were, were, were vitrified embryos. So this works now. It's more complex with the human brain. We have not yet figured out how to do that. Chronicists are very honest about that. They say, you know, we don't know if this will work. We don't know if this will ever work. And we don't know when and if it does. But we think there's, there's, good, medic, there's good scientific reason to believe that th this is very plausible, especially to the scientists of the future. Who knows what the the, the the species, the human species of the future will be able to do probably pretty incredible things. You know, our, our society would be unbelievable to someone in the year 1800. So why wouldn't the future society be just as unbelievable to us? Why wouldn't they be able to take a vitrified brain and say, yeah, we actually do know how to unpause this brain and have it work. That's not that big a stretch. It's not that crazy. So, so essentially that's what crime exists is, 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 you know, uh, you know, if you sign up, then, you know, it depends how you die. If you die in an accident, you're going to have a harder time. No one's going to be there at that moment. And, and it is a, ma a battle for time there. So ideally, you know, you die in a predictable way on a deathbed in a hospital somewhere. And if you're, if you're signed up for cryonics with your annual membership fee, and by the way, people think another myth is they think it's for rich people. Actually, most people can afford this. So I'm currently now signed up for cryonics. And my, current, my bill, my annual bill is about a thousand bucks a year total. That pays for my membership fee. And my, I, I got a, like a very cheap life insurance plan that is just for the purpose of paying. It's, it's made out to the Cranix company, Alcor, and so that you know, whenever I die, that money will go to pay for the, the, the final part of the, the payment. Thousand a year. I mean, I spend a thousand a year on so much shit. I spend that on cable. I spend it on coffee. I spend it on taxis and other things I don't care about, like that aren't important. This it seems like worth it. Even okay, so people say, "Oh, what if Alcor's a scam?" I, I don't think it is. My 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 sense after reading about it and talking to the head of Alcor, I really actually don't think it is. It's it's a nonprofit run by passionate cryonicists who are all signed up themselves. But you know what? Yeah, maybe it's a scam. A B, maybe this whole thing never works. Sure, for a thousand bucks a year, even if there's a one percent chance of this working, I'll take my chances because the alternative is a 0% chance of, close, you know, as, as an atheist. Like, if you're religious, different story here. If you believe there's an afterlife, different story. But for an atheist or someone who doesn't believe strongly in an afterlife, your alternatives is closing your eyes upon death, and that's the end of you forever. And for, when you sign up for chronic, you get to kind of have the, the awesomeness that a religious person does at the end of their life. Where you get to be on your deathbed and say, you never know, I might wake up, I might blink right now, and then wake up in a new place. And... For me, just having that, that hope is almost worth the money. It's like, I'll give my vitrified brain to future humanity, see what you can do. And it gives me some hope that maybe, because you won't feel the passage of time, it'll be like a blink and you'll kind of wake up 
and you'll be in some future year. And ideally, you know, the idea is they, they, they bring you back, they can cure whatever it is that killed you, but also rejuvenate you because the human body and brain is just a physical object. It's just cells. It's not that complicated. A species gets good enough with nanotechnology and art, don't forget artificial intelligence can help. It might very well be able to you wake up with a new fresh body, a young body. They rejuvenate your brain. This is not out of the realm of possibility. And that's all I care about. I just give me a shot, you know, for a thousand bucks a year, give me a shot. So that's the idea. And, and the final thing I'll say is, you know, people like people, a lot of people's instincts were so because death is this just hideous thing that is in all of our faces. And it's just this, you know, Nick Bostrom, this philosopher I like compares death to a dragon that we all just accept. Yes, every year, 60 million people have to go to the dragon. Don't ever question the dragon. And it's not, it don't, it's not even, it's not even bad. That's just, it's good. It's good that they go. To, it's like we we ended up um, like, it's like a Stockholm syndrome hostage situation where we're like, we, we like have been convinced that this is a good thing because we had no way to help it. So we try to make the best. The truth is death sucks. And like, or, no, actually death doesn't suck. Involuntary death sucks. If someone wants to bow out at 90, cryonics isn't going to stop them. If we, if we can live a lot longer than 90, cryonics, that someone will have the option to bow out. Death when you're not ready is what sucks. It's death when you really, really wish you could still be living when your family still needs you or whatever. That's not, no one thinks that's good. When humans used to die at 40, Okay, or 33 was the average lifespan like 200 years ago. I guarantee there were all kinds of people when doctors were saying, I think we can get humans to live to 70 and 80 on average one day. There were people saying, oh, why are you such a narcissist and want all this life? You know, it isn't death a lot of man, like just accept. No, but now that we all live to 80 or, or 90, you know, or the, the average lifespan is, is, is in the 70s on the, on the planet. No one is saying, oh, well. That we're such narcissists for wanting to live to to fight through cancer at the age of sixty, so I can maybe live till eighty. Everyone thinks that's a brave person doing that. We think, of course, you should. It's it's great to try to live till eighty. As soon as cryonics and other developments allow us to live to one hundred and fifty, two hundred, two hundred and fifty, and again, that sounds crazy, but not when you can replace your organs with truly great artificial organs or your re rejuvenate your brain cells. Like all we are is an object. If you can fix it, then there's no reason that that number can't go way up. As soon as you can do that, you know people aren't going to look back and say, oh, this is so like vain to want to live this long. They're going to say, great. This is so great that we now, that, that we can live this long. And it's so sad that people used to just die all the time in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s before they were ready. And they had, or, or they were ready because they convinced themselves, you know, through some, some mind game that this was a good thing and that they're ready to go. When, um, you know, the truth is, if they could have lived longer, they probably, they probably would have had a totally different mindset. So that's my long... <laughs> The long story about chronics. I just think uh, the more you learn about it, the more you're like, wait, this is a total no brainer. And it's amazing. Because before you learn about it, it sounds insane and like icky and like who wants to be frozen? And it's just sound, everything sounds terrible about it and, and a huge waste of money and a scam and crazy and all that. And then as soon as you learn about it, it seems like the only option. You know, the funny thing or the most interesting thing about cryonics is, is that, as you pointed out, is other than kind of the financial cost, there's, there's really no downside, right? Like if it doesn't work, you're in the same boat as if you'd never done it. But if it works, it's a massive upside for you. And so it's almost exactly. like it's like the golden wager. Exactly. Uh, Pascal's wager. Why not? It's it, what do you have? To, like, literally, the alternative is getting like eaten away at, by bacteria underground. Is that that sounds awesome to you. Like or, or being cremated. That sounds that sounds great to you. Like it, you either have a zero percent chance of something cool happening after the moment of your deathbed. Or you have some chance, and and some cryonists think it's not like a one percent chance; it's like a fifty percent chance. Other ones think maybe it's five percent. But either way, yeah, thousand bucks a year. That's I can't think of anything I'm spending a thousand bucks on currently a year that is a better use of that money. Like, you know, people say, oh, you know, you know, that's that's a lot of money. It's not when you think about the things you spend three bucks a day on. So, yeah, that's and and it's just you know you just start paying for it. You adjust your lifestyle to not having that thousand dollars a year. And then you move on. You're just living the same life. You're not even thinking about that expense anymore because it's just built in. And now you have this hope. What a cool thing. So that, that's my full pitch. The why everyone should look into this at least. And by the way, the Alcor website, A-L-C-O-R, Alcor is like the, you know, one of the two major companies that currently does this. I wouldn't be surprised, by the way, my life insurance plan that's currently made out to Alcor, I wouldn't be surprised if I switch it over to like, there, you know, in 20 years, if I'm like, oh, Google or some company like Google has now created like the best cryonics facility in the world. I'm just going to switch then. I'll, I'll, if something that, that I think is more reputable comes along, I'll switch. At the moment, Alcor is the most reputable. And what I was going to say is the Alcor website has a great FAQ. That's long, thorough, you know, well-written FAQ by 
clearly by scientists, which was which was heartening to me to see. This by very smart, reasonable people who are not salesy. They're not trying to sell you anything. They're being just trying to be upfront. It, it, it has a ton more info there. So I hope that any listeners who are intrigued by this do it so we can all hang out in 2400 together and see how cool the phones are then and other things. It's going to be a lot of things that are really cool in 2400 and I want to see them. You know, th- this has been such a fascinating sample of just some of the topics that you cover on Wait But Why. There's so much more that I want to ask you about and, and I wish we could dig deeper on. We may have to do another interview. There's just so many interesting topics. But for listeners who, who are curious about these things, as I said, Tim has written blog posts that are super detailed, very research-backed, rooted in science about both of these topics. And we'll include all that stuff in the show notes as well as the Alcor, Alcor website, everything else. Tim, before before you go, where can people find you and the blog online? Yeah, I'm just everything I do is basically on waitbutwhy.com. W a i t b u t w h y dot com. It's kind of people get confused when they hear it over the phone. And, and yeah, that's just where I put all my blog posts. You know, everything I'm doing the last three years basically is sitting on that site. So uh, that's the answer. And, and then I always try to encourage people who like what I do to subscribe to the email list because e- is subscribing to email list is icky, and I don't like doing it, and I'm sure you don't either. But it's like this is a very unannoying one where we just kind of send out the a post when it's done. And that's it. The only thing the email list is for is but otherwise because posts happen so sporadically, it's it's hard to remember to check the site and it's not like something, you know, when it's going to go up. So the email is the best way to kind of like just stay in touch. And I promise I won't annoy you. Well, Tim, this has been a fascinating conversation and, and topics that I'm really, really interested in. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing these uh, these insights. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every listener email. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes. That helps more and more people discover the science of success. I get a ton of listeners asking, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this information? Because of that, we created an amazing free guide for all of our listeners. You can get it by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, or by going to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and joining our email list. If you want to get all this incredible info, links, transcripts, everything we talked about in this show, and much more, go to our show notes page at scienceofsuccess.co, hit the show notes button at the top, you'll get everything for this episode, and you can find information on all of our previous episodes. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. 